Hi, everyone. Welcome to the UCLA Behavior Evolution and Culture Speaker Series. I'm Clark Barrett. I'm the director of the UCLA Center for Behavior Evolution and Culture, and I'm organizing this speaker series this year. Um, it is our uh, last talk of winter quarter. Uh, and before I announce this week's guest, uh, let me mention a few things. Um, as you all know, we have a website, bec.ucla.edu. If you visit there, you can find links to past presentations, a list of upcoming presentations, which I still need to update for spring quarter, but that will be done soon. And uh, on the Get Involved tab, you can either join or unjoin our listserv, which will allow you to receive um, the announcements for upcoming talks. Uh, let me announce um, the first talk of uh, spring quarter, which will be March 29th, and it is my great pleasure to tell you that our first talk of the spring will be Britt Florkwitz, who is from UCLA and is finishing her PhD right now. Um, her talk will be called At Face Value, the Role of Chimpanzee Facial Expressivity in the Evolution of Gestural Communication and Social Bonding. So we're really excited to have Britt speak to the Beck group um, in spring, really looking forward to that. And uh, today, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sophie Scott from University Co College London. Um, and Sophie's talk will be, It's Funny, The Evolution and Science of Laughter. Uh, let me mention as well, uh, before we welcome Sophie, that um, she has to leave a little early um, so we're going to have to end at 1.15 hour time. So Sophie's going to try to com complete her talk in about 50 minutes um, by 12.50 or so, and then we'll have 20, 25 minutes for, for Q&A, which um, I will um, curate. So uh, if you would like to unmute yourselves for a moment, please um, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Sophie Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie, for visiting. And uh, go ahead and uh, share your screen and get started when you'd like. Brilliant. I am just sharing. Thank you very much for this very kind invitation. Um, I am now failing to find my slides. Is this the right slide? Let's find out. I'm going to share my sound. You should be able to hear some sounds. Let's see if this is the one. Brilliant. Great. So I've given it a slightly punchier title, but this is exactly the same talk as the Good. slide that I gave you. Um, Good reasons, great. Even better. Okay. <laughs> and I'm just, okay. Yeah, um, so thanks very much for this. Uh, these are all reasons which are informing us. They're scientific reasons why laughter is funny. Um, and I should say at the top, I, I think some of what, you know, manifestly some of what I talk about this evening could be applied to other kinds of emotional expressions, but um, I focused on laughter a lot recently because, uh, you know, as you have lots of people working in laughter in your department, um, it's a very, very interesting emotional expression. It's used with great nuance and complexity by many animals uh, and especially humans. Um, so the first reason why laughter is funny is because when we laugh, we make some genuinely peculiar noises. And I mean that by the sort of, the, by comparison to other vocal behaviors that we produce frequently like speech. So just to take you through some examples and many of you I'm sure will have heard some of these before. Um, if you think about laughter as sounding like an animal call rather than a, a sort of a speech-like vocalization, that does help uh, sort of to hear some of the strangeness of laughter. So just, just these are just exemplar laughs. <laughs> Getting a bit stranger. <laughs> 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 I find this next laugh quite distressing because I need him to take more breaths in. <laughs> I need a breath about now, I think. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, apparently, he laughs on inhalations as well as exhalations. So he's going, ha, ha, ha. <gasps> and the way he laughs makes it sound the same, but I find it quite upsetting. And then this laugh, next laugh is, uh, well, the woman says in, in French, mon Dieu, c'est quoi ça? My God, what is that? And you kind of know exactly what she means. This is all one human female. So, one of the main reasons why laughter has these very strange characteristics to it is that it is more like an animal call than it is like speech. It's one of a range of nonverbal emotional expressions that we produce frequently when we're in more extreme emotional states than we, you know, if you are very frightened, you're more likely to say, to scream than to say, I am frightened. And in terms of the way that they are made, they are much more similar to the vocalizations of other mammals than they are like um, speech. So if I show you a dynamic MRI sequence of a human being talking, this is just, she's just talking here. And that's already, you can see the incredible complexity of the movement of the articulators involved in human speech. You've got the tongue continuously deforming, the lips moving, the jaw moving, the soft palate moving. You've got the larynx moving up and down. So continuously reshaping the shape of the vocal tract. Um, whereas other mammals, when they vocalize, make a sound at the larynx and then just shape the vocal tract. They don't move it in this way. There isn't this kind of fle highly flexible movement of the vocal tract associated with other mammals' vocalizations. It's a much more simple way of making a sound. And if we look at laughter in exactly the same way, so this is the same woman laughing, this just looks like a straightforward mammal vocalization. The mouth is open and there is some, you can see there's a lot of movement going on. We'll come back to what that is. There's, the tongue is just sitting at the bottom of the mouth. There's nothing complex happening in terms of that reshaping of the articulators. There is something interesting happening at the back of the pharynx, which is narrowing up a bit. If, um, if you've ever laughed until your throat hurts, it might be part of what's going on there. So we have something which is produced in a way that is much more like the world of animal vocal, mammal vocalizations than human speech. And human speech is very unusual in nature that no other animals can really make the sounds we make. Another reason why laughter is funny is because it can be completely overwhelming. It can be very hard in certain situations to not laugh if once it's started. Um, and that's partly, I suspect, because of the neural control of laughter, which again is different from the neural control or certainly certain kinds of laughter is different from the neural control for speech. So speech production and vocalizations like singing or beatboxing are produced with a very distinct set of networks which are specific to humans. These lateral motor areas for the control of the articulators sit in the left and right sensory motor cortex and they're very, very strongly activated. These are just single people being scanned talking, these two colored panels here, and that's a group study. And what you get is this very, very strong activation of these bilateral motor areas, sensory motor areas during speech production. If those areas are damaged, you would have great difficulty producing speech. It's involved with and associated with voluntary use of the articulators, voluntary control of the muscles that we use for talking or for singing or for other things that you might voluntarily do with your voice. In contrast, nonverbal vocalizations like laughter, particularly those that are produced spontaneously, so ones that are being very reflexive in their production, are associated with this older midline network for the control of vocalizations, which is associated with brainstem structures particularly the um, periaqueductal grey and the anterior cingulate cortex, these very midline structures. Now, interestingly, if you damage these lateral motor fields and you have a severe problem or, or left motor areas which are involved in the higher order control of speech, you would be left with an expressive aphasia. It would be difficult for you to speak. However, you would still be able to produce emotional sounds. You'd be able to cry, laugh, scream, swear. And that's because those vocalizations, these emotional vocalizations, 
are controlled by this older midline vocalization network. And again, this is the network that we share with other mammals. That's how other mammals vocalizations are largely controlled. And one of the things that's actually happening with laughter, and you could see the woman who was laughing in the brain scanner, she was moving up and down a lot, although well, not much movement was happening in the articulators. And that's because laughter involves very big changes in how we use the intercostal muscles, the muscles between the ribs. Now you're all using the intercostal muscles, the muscles between your ribs right now for what's called metabolic breathing. And that's shown here. So if I just pop a breath belt on your chest, which should just measure the expansion and contraction of the rib cage as you breathe, you get this very smooth sinusoidal movement. That's somebody staying alive, air is being drawn in and out. So the intercostal muscles are contracted, pulling the rib cage out and up. This pulls air into the lungs. You then relax the muscles back down. The air is pushed out. So you're all doing it. Don't stop. As soon as we start speaking, we use a completely different pattern of breath control. So now what people are doing when they breathe for speech is they're actually using those same intercostal muscles to control the flow of air through the larynx, the voice box. So they're maintaining a constant subglottal pressure. And if I keep speaking without taking another breath, you can hear that I have to stop work to really, really hard to actually control this. And then I'll have to breathe in again. Now that's what's actually happening here. So you get a completely different pattern of movement of the rib cage when you are breathing for speech or singing or beatboxing or something else that you're doing. And that actually is very specific to humans. We are able to do this because we walk upright. We have as much fine control over the muscles between the ribs as we do over our fingers. That's how precise these movements are. And actually, and there's a whole different talk here, we can only do this because we walk upright. And actually that has given, it, it gives a lot of the, the nature of human speech, its characteristics, this kind of cycle of breath, because being able to breathe out on something other than one metabolic, that, that breathing out on every breath does not work for connected speech. So being able to breathe this way gives you connected speech. It gives you rhythm in the speech. It's how you're initially putting music and pitch into the melody, into the speech, and it's letting you do so over an extended period. So sentences are built up around breath cycles. And in fact, you can tell from how big a breath someone takes at the start of an utterance, how long they are going to speak for. People very rarely start breathing in between sentence elements for sentence structure. So that's, it's like the units for speech planning. Now, as soon as we start laughing, all this stops. And this is just showing you what happens with laughter. So now you get very, very large, very, very big contractions of these same muscles. And each one of these big contractions is just squeezing air out and just making one ha ha vocalization to characterize it crudely. So that's a very different use of the rib cage. And one of the things that is quite interesting about this is if you start laughing, if you think back to the last time you were laughing and you could not stop, it will stop you doing other things with those same muscles. So when you start laughing in very hard, laughing spontaneously in a way that you may not even want to be doing, but you can't now stop laughing, it stops you from talking. It stops you from breathing. It's just squeezing air out of you because humans laugh on big exhalations, unlike chimps. And it is trying to kill you. It is a relatively dangerous activity. It's one of the reasons why um, if you have a compromised cardiovascular system, the pressure within the thoracic cavity is very much raised when you start laughing and that does put you at more risk. Don't stop laughing, but it's why it's dangerous for some people. What this means in practice is that the first thing when somebody starts to laugh that starts to change about their voice is frequently the pitch of their voice because you start to affect this lovely constant subglottal pressure that you manage with breathing for speech and that's controlling the pitch of the voice. So if you hear somebody start to laugh, that's frequently what starts to go wrong first. And I've got an example of this here. Sing the rocks and pop. So this is somebody who's about to read the news on the BBC's flagship Radio 4 news programme in every morning called the Today programme. So listen to the pitch of her voice. Sing the rocks and popular replacement has now been dismissed with the army's popular chief of staff, Jack Twat, taking over. A 40-foot sperm whale, which was stranded in the Firth of Forth for more than four days, is now thought to be swimming towards open waters again. It freed itself late last night. Marine experts are hoping to establish this morning whether the whale is finally back at sea.
Good luck to the whale. Ten past eight is the time. An investigation is underway at the maze. So, um, if you are not a native or a British English speaker, you may have picked up there was an emotional change there and not necessarily one that was laughter. You may have thought it was crying. It, it is not absolutely, it, it's not totally dissociated from how she's speaking. Um, but if you like voices, this is a fantastic clip. The man coming down the line has got to say what is quite a rude word. I don't know how it works in North America, but where I come from, twat is a very rude word indeed. And he just goes for it. Popular chief of staff, Jack Twat. And then back in the studio, just before Charlotte Green, who's about to read the news, starts to read the news, there's a pause and there's a whisper in that pause. And someone leans into Charlotte Green and they say one thing and one thing only. They just whisper, Jack Twat. And they're doing that to make her laugh. And interestingly, it takes a few beats before that happens. She's talking normally at first and then she starts to go. And first of all, you get this loss of control over the, what's happening at the larynx. Then the pitch of her voice shoots up as she starts to stop being able to speak altogether. And then by the end, she's continuing to make squeaking noises after she stopped talking because now she is laughing fully. Now she does not want to laugh. The BBC does not like news presenters and sports broadcasters showing emotion. They call it breaking. They will, she will get in trouble for this, but she still can't, once it started, that's it. She's going to laugh. Another reason why laughter is funny is because it's a universal emotional expression. Now, by no means are all human emotional expressions or emotional experiences universal ones. There are some emotions that are highly culturally specific. There are other emotions that are might be similar emotions by description across different cultures, but not sharing the same expressions. And then there are a handful of emotions that seem to share expression and have similarities in their meanings. And those are termed by Paul Ekman to be universal expressions of emotion. By no means is this our entire emotional world, and it doesn't mean that there couldn't be other cultural differences built on top of that. Um, this is all of it really rests on the original work of Charles Darwin, who wrote about the expression of, animal, of emotions in animals and man. Um, and then throughout the last century, there was a lot of work picking up on the extent to which there could be any emotions that could be recognised across different cultures, no matter where you came from and what exposure you'd had to other cultures. Um, and this was all done with faces. And when I was first working in this area, um, we got interested in trying to establish, well, could any of this be true with voices anyway, with vocal expressions of emotion? Some people have argued that in fact, the face is the dominant mode for human emotional expressions and the voice kind of adds in things like arousal levels. So possibly there are no universally recognized emotions from the voice that could that's a possibility so this is one of the reasons why we started asking the question there was not a study where we were setting out to look at laughter but laughter was one of the emotions that we were studying and my phd student Lisa Sota was working on this and we were initially setting out to replicate the recognition of emotions like that have been demonstrated by Paul Ekman to be universally recognized from the face so you've got happiness sadness fear surprise anger disgust and we also added in some positive emotions because we were very interested in those. And Disa did several trips out to Namibia working on this. It is difficult working with sound in the middle of the Namibian desert. It's not easy and it took several trips and it's hard doing cross-cultural studies. I mean, it's essential we do them, but it is hard. Um, and I'm just going to summarise this. We have people from the UK producing emotional expressions. And we also have this, the, these people are the Hemba. They live in northern Namibia. And Disa and my postdoc Frank Eisner were driving for days with a translator to find them. So they have not encountered um, the Europeans before. They haven't, they're not contaminated by our culture. They recognize the emotional expressions, these nonverbal emotional expressions produced back in London. It does suggest there is some level of a element of universality to these expressions. And likewise, the Himba are produced sounds. We get see but if people back in the UK could recognize those. So just to give you an example, have a listen to this and see what emotion you think this guy is expressing. <laughs> so you get absolutely no points whatsoever for spotting that he started laughing at the end there and it probably sounded very recognisable to you as a laugh. The emotion he was expressing before then you may have picked up that it's sounding quite positive. It's quite full of energy. It's quite high on arousal. He's actually expressing triumph there. Now that's interesting because 
the although we have to find culturally appropriate ways of describing that emotion he knows exactly what you mean to 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 celebrate something to feel triumphant to feel like you've achieved something um however the expression is not universal because the himba don't recognize british people making sort of achievement or, or triumph sounds like woohoo or yes although i think we've got woohoo from the simpsons and similarly, people back in the UK don't hear this sort of I, 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 are sounding all that celebratory. They're slightly, slightly more than the opposite direction. So that's an example of an emotion that is not a universal expression, because even though the emotion has some meaning across these different cultures, the expression is not recognised. And this is what we found. So these are the emotions that had been previously studied from the face. We've got anger, disgust, fear, sadness and surprise. And then instead of happiness, which actually isn't particularly well expressed as a single emotion in the voice. We've got triumph, laughter, pleasure and relief. And you can see that we've replicated Paul Ekman's work based on all these other people from the last century, showing that there is some cross-cultural recognition for anger, disgust, fear, sadness and surprise. If you are disgusted by something in the Namibian desert and go, Ugh, that is a recognisable expression. The only emotion which is crossing the bar for the English recognising the Himba and the Himba recognising the English is laughter. There is something going on with relief and I'm happy to take questions on that. Um, so that was interesting. It did suggest certainly that um, with, with some evidence that this could be an emotion with some degree of universality to it. And then of course we go off and read the animal literature and realise, well, we should have expected this. We didn't do that, that study in Namibia to be a study of laughter. It was a study of nonverbal expressions of emotion. And then we found that laughter was the, the positive emotion that seemed to be universally recognised. Um, then we find, of course, we're not the only animals that laugh. We should have expected this. It was the best candidate for it, the positive emotions we were working with that would have these characteristics. So laughter is associated with tickling in human infants. And of course, you can't just march up and tickle any infant. You have to you know, the, the child has to have some degree of familiarity or comfort with you. And you can't tickle yourself. You does require you being there with someone else to be tickled. So tickling is something that emerges actually in a social interaction. And that's probably its original role. But it's also exactly where you see laughter appearing. And I know there are people who do a lot more work on this than me on the call. But, um, you know, chimpanzees laugh in a very similar way. You first see this behaviour emerging in infancy went with tickling and it's even been shown to have this kind of characteristic in rats so there is probably a <laughs> more laughter out there um, as, an, as an emotional vocalization in animals but it's very interesting the similarity between the appearance of laughter across these different uh, species of apes and rats. Um, and of course as we get older Laughter becomes more complex and is strongly associated with play. Play is, as again, many of you are studying a great deal more than me, a very important behaviour for mammals. We've got large brains. We have an extended period of being juveniles. And in that time we are growing up, one of the things we're doing is training up our big brains. And one of the ways that we train up our big brains is through play. It's a very important behaviour. It's a highly ambiguous behaviour. You need to indicate that your intentions are playful. So you get things like play face, you get things in dogs like play bows. And this is really just to point out how very similar to a chimpanzee my brother looks. Very hard to get photographs of human adults playing. And then you also get this even, even tremendous subtlety here. So laughter, when Panksepp said, when you have, you know, wherever you find laughter in animals, it's like it's a it almost functions like an invitation to play. Let's take part in this activity. But it also helps you disambiguate your intentions my intentions are playful so there's that very interesting work with devocalized rats from a couple of years ago showing that devocalized rats play with other rats um, but they are more likely to get bitten because they can't make the sound that indicates that their behavior is playful and that means that their intentions could be misread now that's laughter working quite a complex way in rats Another reason why laughter is funny is because we can catch laughter. Laughter is behaviourally contagious. A lot of the laughter you produce is simply because you caught it from somebody else. 
Um, and again, this was a study that was never set out to be a study of laughter. It's a functional imaging study looking at brain responses to emotional vocalizations. Most of my work is very boring work on speech perception and production. And I thought it would be interesting to look at the brain networks involved in laughter, well, no, in nonverbal emotion processing. And what you find is very strikingly and very unlike speech, you get a lot of activation of orofacial mirror regions. So these are brain regions that are activated both by hearing a sound and by moving your face to produce the sound silently. And that's what you're seeing up here, but it's not the same for all the emotions. It is much more strongly driven by the high arousal positive emotions. What that means in practice is that the orofacial priming response is much stronger for laughter and to some degree triumph than it is for very recognisable negative emotions like fear and disgust. And that was interesting because we'd been reading kind of Robert Provine's work and he talks a lot about behavioural contagion and laughter and we thought well obviously is that what we're seeing here? Are you seeing this priming response? And this priming response is really strong. I've just got an example here of two men doing a television broadcast, I think it is in North America, and one of them gets the giggles. What I want you to watch is the other man, the man who doesn't have glasses on, who does not get the giggles, and in fact, if anything, looks quite worried about what's happening, but he also keeps laughing. And the reason why he keeps laughing is pure contagion. He is just catching laughs from the man he's with. Here we go. We're really trying to get out there in the, in the records, and, but, but we're just going to sing for you. I'm going to sing for you right now. Okay. I cry in the midnight hour, yeah. You heard my cry. You brought up all of my tears. This world, wow, wow. Laughing. I'm still loving you, oh, Lord, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very well. Excellent. I was excellent. Yeah. Smile. <laughs> <Nice. laughs> <Well. laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at I was certainly, I certainly did enjoy that. I'm sure. I'm sure he's caught up in the spirit. He's uh, getting the Holy Ghost over here. <laughs> we want to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he has the spirit. Uh, he still loves you. We want to get, uh, get his address. <laughs> get his address. And uh, we want to give you a t shirt here. Oh! Uh, send him a t shirt. <laughs> right here. Right. More consciousness. Enjoy oh. that, uh, Danny. Oh. From Florida. Oh, I know the same. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it broke me up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, be right back. we'll be right back. So there are many different examples of contagious laughter out there, but it's very, very powerful. And people often will, you know, kind of argue away what well, oh, I was laughing because it was funny. But a lot of the time, laughter really is just being caught from someone else. And that's something we learn to do. We're not born showing contagious behaviours. We learn to do contagious behaviours. And this also takes us into point number six, and this very much builds on Robert Provine's work. Most of the time, laughter is nothing whatsoever to do with jokes. If you ask people what makes them laugh, they'll talk about jokes and humour. But actually, if you look at people, they laugh primarily when they're with other people. You're 30 times more likely to laugh when you're with other people, and most laughter happens in conversation. And Greg Bryant's done some really lovely work on this. So what you have is a behaviour that we think is is a, is a, and it's a very strong cultural belief laughter is what you do when something is funny that most of the time it is remains a f an extremely social behavior it's primed just by the presence of other people and it will be produced more and in a different way the more you like those people we all laugh more than we think we do everybody with a handful of studies that have looked at this find that everybody underestimates how much laughter they produce and there's a lot of it we've been looking at conversations between friends and finding that uh, on average, 10% of the time, the friends are having a conversation, well, in our corpus, an average of 10% is just spent laughing. It's a huge amount of time. So it's modulated by social context. And what it means is that, and even actually, contagious laughter is modulated by social context. You're more likely to catch a laugh from someone you know than someone you don't know. So when we look at laughter and humans and adults in particular, 
We can see that we laugh sometimes just because other people are laughing. We will laugh to make and maintain social bonds. It's a very efficient way of making new bonds with people and reinforcing the bonds we already have. We will laugh in conversations to show that we, in a communicative way, effectively, we will laugh to show that we understand, we agree, we remember, we recognise. And Robert Provine found that at any one point in time, the person who laughs most is the person who's talking. People are using it communicatively to get other people to show that they agree, to understand, they remember, they recognise. And we will also laugh to reframe things as play. We will laugh to make sure that we are all right, a difficult situation is not as serious as we thought. Um, and that's an interesting use of laughter because, of course, depending on the exact situation, it can be a very ambiguous way that can be misread. And I will come on to that at the end. So what we have is a very interesting emotion and or an emotional expression. Of course, what that emotion is, I have sort of skirted around. Darwin thought it was an emotional expression of, of joy. And we've got Panksepp saying it's an invitation to play. And I think it's... From what, from my sort of perspective, I think one of the things that's very interesting about it is it's an emotion that lives in these social spaces. We do laugh when we're on our own, but we are so much more likely to laugh when we're with other people. If it is a social joy, well, if it is a joy, it's a social joy. And maybe that playful element is simply how adult humans are expressing their you know, playful activities in these conversations. It's never neutral, which is another reason why laughter is funny. When you hear laughter, you're always trying to understand it. Sorry, I pressed that too soon. So we did it. We collected examples of laughter where we either had people laughing spontaneously, i.e. they were laughing in a way they could not stop. The laughter is, is a reactive laughter to so something that has made them laugh and now they can't stop laughing. This is... Um, this is me laughing spontaneously. Actually, for fact fans, this is me laughing at something Carolyn McGettigan has done that's made me laugh very hard. <laughs> now, this kind of spontaneous laughter is very different from more communicative laughter. It's higher in pitch, it's longer, you get funny squeaks and whistles, a bit like those laughs I played at the start. And then this kind of laughter is, more, is, is an example of one of the more communicative kinds of laughs. <laughs> <laughs> and they're lower in pitch and they're shorter and they start and stop more quickly and in fact they're very often certainly for the UK corpus that we have that was a very nasal laugh <laughs> that's a kind of sound to it and that's actually something you do not find in our, cor our corpus in the spontaneous laughs at all but it's quite common in the communicative laughs and I think that's probably because people are kind of marking that this is shared laughter I'm giving you this laughter I'm laughing with you in this way and interestingly, when you put people in the scanner again, so this study, we were just interested in the laughter and people didn't know it was a study on laughter and they didn't know there were sort of different kinds of laughs in there. And we put in other sorts of sounds to dis distract them. So horrible disgust sounds, things like that. And interesting, and they're, they're not doing anything. They're just listening. It doesn't matter. The brain is categorizing and responding differently to the laugh. So you get more activation in auditory areas shown here in blue to those more spontaneous, helpless laughs, the, the, the high-pitched one I played you. And I was worried that we get a lot less activation to the more communicative laughter, and I was wrong. In fact, if anything, you get more activation, and you're seeing this all here in pink, and it's in dorsomedial thalamus and medial prefrontal cortex, cortical fields, which is interestingly, shows a lot of overlap with classic theory of mind areas. And I think that's because when you hear somebody laughing spontaneously, it's nice and it's an engaging sound but it's very un it's not ambiguous at all it's very easy to classify that as a you know as a spontaneous laugh whereas when you hear somebody going ha, 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 there is a reason why there's an intention behind that laughter and you're trying to work it out even if you're having your brain scanned and it doesn't matter what why that person's laughing i think that's what we're seeing here we've got a more inherently ambiguous signal and that ambiguity is associated with some meaning in the intentions the social intention of the person laughing Interestingly, that priming response that I showed you before is not greater for the, the spontaneous laughs, which I thought it would be. People tend to think they're more contagious. And it's there for both the types of laughs. And very interestingly, it seems to be, rather than distinguishing between the two kinds of laughs, it's something that varies across participants. We gave people a test when they came out of the scanner. And they just had to classify the two types of laughs. And the more accurate they were in that, well, their score on that correlated with the degree to which they'd shown this priming response earlier when they heard any laugh. So it's not just contagion. If you are getting primed to join in when you hear laughter, any laugh, 
you are better at understanding what it means. And of course, this matters because A, it suggests there's some individual variation here. And of course, we do know that we learn to laugh. Laughter is a, for want of a better phrase, a prepotent response. Blind and deaf babies will laugh, even if they've never heard or seen laughter when, when they're tickled. But beyond that, we learn how to use this. We learn how it works and the social conventions of our culture around the use of laughter in, com in these communicative settings. Um, you can see this here. We haven't finished analysing this data set because it's huge. We've got a massive group of people here, over 1,800 people, making classifications of laughter, rating laughter as kind of communicative or more um, spontaneous across different age ranges. So we've got people from the age of three up to their 70s. This is a study we did at the Science Museum. And what you can see here is that children don't know what you mean. If you ask people, children to classify laughs, they just, well, it's a laugh, what are you talking about? And then as they, with the real spontaneous laughs, you see that behavior improving pretty quickly. This is just very simple curve fitting here. But by the time they're hitting, you know, getting towards the end of puberty, they are hitting peak performance on this. Whereas this more communicative laughter, you have a slower slope. And just to show you where they start to, reach peak performance. People are not hitting peak performance with this more so communicative form of laughter until they're in their late 30s. And probably that's because there is not only are we learning about laughter, we continue learning about laughter throughout our early adult life because there is no other way to learn about the social use of laughter than to learn about it in the interactions that you have, learn about the laughter of other people, learn about your own laughter. And there's going to be a big, you can see there how much variation there is. And there are probably really important things that affect this. So this is a study that we did with S.E. Vidding's lab with boys at risk of psychopathy. So these are teenage boys who are high in callous and un unemotional traits and they have conduct disorders. And what they, they do not report finding laughter as contagious as normally developing teenage boys. And you see a different response in the brain. They do not show the same priming response as the normally developing boys. Now, these boys, they're at risk of psychopathy. We don't know how that's going to play out. But also, we don't know what the direction of causality is here. We don't know if they are showing a reduced response to laughter because they've never had an opportunity to learn about the use of laughter contagiously, or if they um, the psychological profile that they have because they are at risk of psychopathy has impaired their ability to learn that. We don't, so the direction of causality is not clear here. But what you're seeing is a difference, and of course it's a difference that will have big effects on the sorts of social interactions that they have because so much laughter is just being shared in this contagious way. Another reason why laughter is funny because it makes things funnier. My PhD student Ceci Kai was interested in trying to develop a a sort of more implicit test of laughter. So uh, she had the very good idea of taking jokes and asking people to rate how funny jokes were and then to see what difference it made if you added laughter onto the end of the joke and what difference the kind of laughter makes. So we took really, really bad jokes like what's the best day for cooking? Friday. Deliberately, absolutely dreadful. And then we got people to rate those jokes. So the line here, this is joke by joke because there's quite a lot of joke to joke variation. The line in red is the average rating for how funny the joke is without any laughter at all. And then we added laughter on and we got different people to rate the jokes. And you can see here that as soon as you add any laughter, that makes the joke funnier. And the, if the more spontaneous the laughter, which is shown here in green, the funnier it makes the joke. And now that's really interesting. It doesn't, it, we don't know why that's happening. Is it just contagion? making the laugh, the joke seem funnier, you're, you're, you're getting some desire to laugh and that's having a retrospective effect or is it because somebody else, it sounds like somebody else liked that joke or is it because that's just normally in the wild when people laugh then that's because there was something was funny so you know we don't know but it's a very interesting demonstration of the the sort of stickiness of laughter, laughter will will try and attribute it, why is someone laughing well must be something to do with that joke and that joke must have been a funny one. Interestingly this gave us very different, so Ceci was interested in this because she's been looking at laughter in people with autism and people with autism show the exact same response when you frame the question this way. So there's no difference between neurotypical and autistic people on this test. And finally Laughter is funny because it can make things better. So we've kind of talked about laughter as a spontaneous emotional expression. We've talked about laughter as a, a communicative use of an emotional expression in conversations. And they seem to play 
interestingly potentially different roles i suspect there's it's probably more of a spectrum than two distinctly totally different types of laughter but there's another very interesting um set of studies looking at what how people use emotional expressions to manage difficult situations so this is work from um robert levinson's lab and you know again i'm sure more of you know more about this than me but looking at married couples over decades getting the couples into the lab putting them in a stressful situation where they're wild up to a polygraph and you can see people becoming more stressed and what robert levinson finds is that people couples who deal with the stressful experience of having to discuss a problem in their relationship just run that one around your head for a second they if they use positive affect they not only and he means things like smiles and laughter they not only immediately become more less stressed but they're also the couples who stay together for longer and they're happier together and it's not because the laughter is a bit of like magic dust that makes everything okay because it only works if both members of the couple laughs so laughter is that you're thinking back is that reframing things as play now you have its roots in this ability to in close emotional relationships be able to use laughter as a way of together negotiating a better mood and it's not that the laughter is a bit of magic dust, it's more that the laughter is, a, is an index of that relationship. Now, Robert Levinson um, has lots of very nice videos of elderly couples making each other laugh. And I haven't got that. I've got a, a YouTube clip of some young men in the former East Germany trying to make a video that goes wrong. What I want you to do is watch this and watch what happens when what they there's an emo things go wrong and there's a change in the emotional uh, state of everybody concerned so you can see he's wearing swimming trunks and he looks cold i've edited out a lot of swearing which is inexplicably in english he's got a towel it's quite apprehensive no one's laughing it's apprehensive and my new band is called Siskill. <laughs> His friend is bleeding. He's not laughing. He's not laughing yet. Oh my gosh. Oh, I can't see guys. Now he looks up. <laughs> and now he starts to get laughs up to get him. <laughs> and he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> They've actually collapsed. Hey, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the nice things about working with laughter is people frequently send me videos of people laughing um, and quite often people say well here we have an example of schadenfreude because he he gets smacked on the backside and that's funny but it is more complex than that if you watch what happens carefully everyone is quite apprehensive they're clearly expecting something uh, maybe amusing to happen when he goes through the ice into the water but as soon as that doesn't happen and also there isn't blood and bone everywhere his friends start to laugh and it takes a couple of beats and then that invitation to play works and he starts to laugh as well and instead of being angry like stop filming me or being frightened like i think my leg is broken can you get help me the invitation to play works and then this is hilarious this is what we were always hoping if you don't believe me imagine that exact scenario and his friends laughing like that if he was lying there with a visibly broken leg it would be unwatchable what we're seeing is the laughter working so laughter is really funny and laughter really matters. I think um, now there's some noble exceptions in the room here, so I'm not criticising you, but I think as a, as a field, psychology and neuroscience has been really shocking in ignoring some of the emotional experiences people have that are positive. We tend to define emotional as almost entirely negative in our research. And in this, I would have concluded myself for years. Um, and I think it's really time to start, well, you know, there are so many more things to find out about laughter and how it's working in these uh, you know, social interactions, for example, and, and the brain systems that are involved in actually producing it. And I suspect that it, that really matters because looking at laughter does allow us to go from people's emotional experiences into their social world. And that makes it a very important emotion to study more. And it's definitely time to take laughter more seriously. Thank you very much.
Thank you Thanks for a great talk, Sophie. Um, really interesting. I see a lot of connections with uh, things that people are doing here at UCLA um, and lots of discussions that we've had about contagious laughter and other things like that. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Um, just to remind everyone, we have to wrap it up a little bit early. We have to end at 1.15, but we still have 30 minutes for Q&A. So um, let us proceed. Uh, if you have a question, um, use the raise hand um, icon and I will call on you on, in order. Uh, first, let's take a question from Sasha. Hi, Sophie. Thanks for a great talk. Really interesting. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about the significance of laughter and laughter contagion being learned behavior, or like we were saying laughter in social context other than just tickling. And I, I don't know if there's any information that you know about, like, what is that learning based on? Like, are there specific inputs that are needed to learn properly? Or is it just that everyone learns around the same pace? Well, I don't think we know. I don't do baby work. I have a PhD student at the moment, uh, um, Addison Belling, who is looking at babies' use of laughter and the brain systems in sort of six seven month olds when it's well established as a behavior they still don't laugh contagiously at that age they laugh when their parents do something and then their parents laugh um so there's i mean i just don't think we know enough about the timeline all we know is that it is it is learned and it is interesting if you look at baby so parents do something to make the baby laugh tickling peekaboo interestingly peekaboo only seems to work with humans um and then that's, you know, that's like a, you know, build up. And by the time babies are one, they have a very sophisticated uh, use of laughter, but <laughs> the, the contagion isn't there. So one of the things that does not make babies laugh is parents laughing. The parents have to do something to make the baby laugh. And then that makes the parents laugh. And I, I, I mean, that is my best guess for the, we, we're teaching babies to laugh by our, associating our laughter with theirs. And that's been driven by something that made them laugh. But we don't, we don't know beyond that. That is a pure speculation based on having had one child. So I don't know. Um, I think one of the things that there are a lot of things that we have not got a good grasp on developmentally. And again, this is no critique of you. I think this is, this is a big failure of some, you know, the, the wider field. Um, and that, that's one of them. We just don't know. Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, um, let's uh, take a question from Dan. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Sophie. Really interesting. Um, a, a couple of questions um, and, and, and a comment or two also. So, um, first, can you tell us a bit more about the uh, Science Museum study with the kids? Yeah. And how you were asking them, because the, the, you said, well, they just don't understand at all, and it's unclear whether they are unable to differentiate the two stimulus types or they don't understand the question being asked. Those are not the same thing. They're not the same thing. I suspect they don't really understand the question. Um, we tried to set it up so it was accessible. I'm now utterly failing how to. My, my, my then postdoc, he does a lot of kid work with children, Saloni Krishnan, ran the study. And it was designed so it could be done by a three-year-old helped by a parent. Um, and we were asking them to think about, you know, well, does it sound like they're that, I'm trying to, I'm not struggling to remember the exact phrasing, but they were just being asked to say how much you felt that this was a, a laugh that was meant to some degree or someone sort of, you know, I'm failing very badly here. We also asked about contagion. Does this make you want, and actually contagion looks very similar. Um, so children just don't find it contagious. They don't, it's not working in the same way. Um, so my suspicion is it's more about the question than anything else, but I don't think, again, this is based on anecdote, not data, but if you are, I can remember my son being um, of an age where he was having, a, he went to a birthday party and he knew the birthday boy and he didn't know any of the other birth, or the other boys there because they all went to the same school as the birthday boy, didn't know him. And at a certain point at tea, they all just started laughing at him because they didn't know him and they were laughing at you know, how silly he was. And he thought it was hilarious and was joining in. And then within about 
six months, he was an absolute zealot for spotting with someone laughing at him. You know, what is the intention behind that? So I think you're on a very, it's probably tracking things like theory of mind that are things you acquire. Like there is a, st there's a period of your life when it, you, you don't ever, th there's no such thing as a lie because you can't conceive of what a lie would mean. And that's, you know, I, th I think that kind of social understanding of laughter is tracking something a bit more like that. So thanks. I, I would introduce just a, a, a couple of cautionary remarks and I imagine Brooke is gonna have a cautionary remark as well in just a minute. But um, uh, um, the, the fact that, that infants don't do something doesn't mean that they learn to do it. So um, I wasn't born with a beard and you weren't born with teeth, um, but you didn't learn that and I didn't learn this, right? Um, uh, the, you know, infants don't show motion sickness either. Um, and the only thing resembling disgust is a bitter response. Mm. But there's a very strong case to be made that at least core disgust is not learned. Um, and certainly motion sickness is not learned. Um, so I think that um, the, the, the timing of many different adaptations um, uh, can vary across ontogeny um, as a function of the utility of that mechanism at different points in life. So I, 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 you know, I completely agree with you that theory of mind is important in understanding volitional laughter. And um, I think your brain imaging results are quite compelling in that regard. And it fits with that being um, a, a, an intentional communicative act um, governed by, you know, all of the same processes as, as any other intentional act and understanding it requires theory of mind. But I don't think that the same can be said for contagious laughter. Um, I think the thing I would say that would argue towards something more complex about contagious laughter than it just appears is that other factors do seem to modulate it. So it was appearing differently in those boys with a risk of psychopathy, or certainly in their reported responses. And also because it's social, you laugh, you're much more likely to catch contagious behavior from someone you know than someone you don't know. And that does suggest to me that there is something at least moderating it. If familiarity makes a big difference, which it really does, then it can't just be that you're laughing because something you have heard laughter there is something else is mediating it. And that is at least suggests that that could be something that's about how you have learned it. You have learned it in the context where you did know those people. But I mean, I I mean no, your point is well made, we don't know. Yeah, I disagree, but I, I see many colleagues who wanna, who wanna participate. So I'll, I'll uh, rest my case for now. Okay, sounds good. Uh, next, we have a question from Brooke. Hi, um, thanks so much. Um, so I, um, I have a little bit of fam familiarity with this topic, but not very much in that I've helped collect data for, um, for one of uh, Greg and Dan's projects looking at laughter, but I've also worked with Himba for um, more than 10 years. So um, I have a question, but I also, I wanna just, I have a comment first, which is just, um, I, I would, I, I, I disagree with the characterization of Himba not having um, any contact with Europeans. I think it's, it's a, um, I, th I think it's, it's a, a dangerous way to portray them um, and an unfair way to portray them. Um, I work in a very, very remote region, usually much more remote than the psychologists who are coming out and doing studies who often use the same research assistants that I do. And the guy in your video was wearing a, you know, a jersey, a soccer, you know, sports jersey. Um, so I just, I, I don't think that takes away from your results at all. That's not what, at all what I'm trying to say, but I just think that it's important that we um, characterize people in the proper context and him, they all have cell phones. They all, um, you know, have, have had for a long time. They may not have cell phone reception out there, but I mean, I'm out all the way to the border of Angola and I've been doing it for 10 years. And I'm, I mean, I don't know, you can, you might disagree, but it's very hard to find him who haven't had any European contact. Well, I suppose I'm talking about um, data that was collected between 2002 
and 2006 so we're uh, we're going over 15 years ago so okay yeah they probably um, didn't have cell phones then because i started in not, 2010 and there were very not. few cell phones but european contact has been going on for a very long time i mean well and indeed but the the um that wasn't the the experience that the people working in my lab had was that the people they were working with had not met people from europe before so that was you know and you know it's not it's not a all you're trying to do is say, because the possibility of people being familiar with these things is there, then, you know, you do need to be, you know, try your best to find a community that haven't been sort of contaminated by your culture to show that these things could possibly show elements that are. And I think it's interesting that we found lots of things that weren't, you know, recognised cross-culturally. We had, you know, we, we were finding cases for and cases against. and. You know, and to be honest, the bigger problem we had was the first set of data that DISA came back with, um, which would have been 2002 or 2003. Um, we had, uh, we showed them to Paul Ackman and he said, no one will believe you because she had been playing the stimuli and she had been writing down the responses and the, the danger of leaking what's actually happening to the person taking part in the test is huge with emotional data it's big in everything but it's massive for emotion entirely unwittingly and indeed when we went back out with two people and we're doing it so that the experimenters were blind then it did reduce the effects so that was you know that was i think the, the one of the larger problems we had um my question was um i guess more of a methodological question which is um so the I assume you did these um, that that you were playing audio clips and there but without any video or context, right? Um, so I'm just wondering whether playing so something like laughter, it's not surprising to me, right? That that you can listen to a clip of laughter and and take things about the context of it just with an audio clip but with something like triumph like or, or celebration that you showed it's it's I guess not surprising to me that that would be that even though you would have the same emotion that it's expressed different ways and it would be difficult to decipher by just listening to a little audio clip and I guess I'm just wondering whether you're we're sort of essentializing this down to the point that you lose the ecological validity that a person would normally have when they're trying to interpret what's happening in a situation. And so like, have you ever thought about trying to use video clips or does that, like I'm trying to balance the need to be able to, to isolate what you're trying to look at with it handicapping people so much that it makes it almost impossible to answer. Well, I suppose I would say that um, you, you have to start somewhere and that everything had been done with faces and they weren't just, they weren't videos either, they were just photos. And there are claims in the literature that the voice does not convey enough information. So generally, you just, uh, you could not get that kind of detail. Um, and we had done cross, not, I wouldn't dignify it with the term cross-cultural, but, you know, we'd, we'd shown that these stimuli could be recognised in other European countries, but that's not really a particularly strong case. Um, and that's, you know, we are starting from a very fine-grained approach, but the, you know, the, the bigger argument was, well, this is something that is there in faces and not in voices, so let's, okay, well, let's see if we can do it with voices. And when you get the parameters right, you can. But that's experimental psychology. That's, you know, th that doesn't mean that you could never recognise emotion from the face. And it's certainly, I mean, I think with laughter, you get huge cues just from body movement. You know, you can be sitting behind someone and you can tell that they are laughing from how they move. So there's, in the wild, the existence of laughter is, if anything, something that we pay a huge amount of attention to and are trying to understand all elements of the context, not just to say that it's laughter, but why are they laughing? Are they laughing at me? Am I included in it? All of that's what you're reading. That wasn't what we were asking there. It really was a very basic, can this even be got off the ground? Can people do this? Does it mean anything? And there were people arguing that you couldn't you know that 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 it's entirely you know that the face is dominant and i'm not saying that the face couldn't be <laughs> many of these things actually carrying as much if not more information but that was that that was the starting point for it um and i think it's you know 
yeah, it, it, it's always a problem in experimental psychology. You break it down into tiny pieces and it is really important to bear in mind the there is a bigger structure to that. We don't build up our experiences from, I think it is a laugh, you know, I think it's not, you know, that's not how it, not how the brain is dealing with the information. Thanks. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, let's take a question from Greg. Thanks. Thanks, Sophie. That was interesting. Um, your talks always make me think of like a million things I want to try to look at. Um, one thing I've been thinking about a lot is the relationship between spontaneous and volitional um, vocal production. And um, I've written about it quite a bit. And I've been persuaded more recently by Kasha, who happens to be here, and others that, um, that in non-humans, there is actually a fair amount of evidence that there is some volitional uh, production, um, though it's, um, you know, documenting it behaviorally has not really been prevalent. And then conversely, I'm interested in to, to what extent does spontaneous vocal production actually inter, um, interfere with speech? So you have these great examples, and I actually have some more I want to send you. I mean, I've been kind of finding these lately, but um, it seems like a lot of times what you might get are these very short bursts of spontaneous production, the little laughs that come in conversation that actually are genuine, and then it goes away. And so the contagion thing that doesn't happen or the where you can't stop laughing doesn't happen. But you have you ever seen that in your own data where you have these very little bursts um, of a real laugh and then it might come, it might arise out of a volitional laugh or it might turn into a volitional laugh and then it goes away really quickly. And then how, how would you tell? Um, I don't know if we could absolutely tell. We certainly have the, this corpus of friends talking. Um, I think you probably have things exactly that work like you described. Sometimes they just flip over into laughing a great deal together with no speech at all. Um, and other times there are these shorter things. I'm sure you could look for it. I mean, I'm, one of the reasons why I would like to get back into the lab and back into the scanner is to try and actually map, because I think it's easier to define these volitional and these spontaneous systems neurally. Um, and I think, because we know where, they, where, they, where those are in humans, and I suspect that it is something much more of a spectrum on the and as you say that the priming can be pushing things in one you know priming could be pushing you towards something more spontaneous but that it's not necessarily um something where you've either got one system going or the other system going so my sus I, I suspect that you might still at one end of things have that kind of unable to speak helpless laughter as the most extreme form and then at the other end something more like a huh but then in between, that's not going to be just one, you know, not one system at one time doing one thing. I suspect that the two are interacting a lot more and that would, that would fit with what you're describing. I think. I've done this paradigm where I have people volitionally laugh until they actually laugh, which is horribly awkward to listen to and really painful to watch because sometimes people can't get there. But when they do yeah. get there, it seems like it's a step function. Like all of a sudden it just yeah. shifts over. Something else is gone, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so do you have any opinions about um, about the non-human literature in terms of degree of volitional control over their voices? Well, I mean, manifestly, Kazi is right. I mean, it's not, um, you can, you know, I, I was drawing a very simplistic comparison there. But we the, the lateral motor areas have been very well described and mapped out in humans. And because you know we we have all these for this, this extraordinary degree of volitional control over things like breathing in our hands that are quite extraordinary you know quite unmatched it's and we know what the networks are it's harder to do those studies in animals it's, it would be very very interesting to know what the networks look like actually what sort of other things start to kick in what kind of lateral motor systems are involved when you have that it, yeah so definitely i mean it, manifestly you see examples of it it's so right. yes yeah. Um, I, my only last little comment would be um, when you were calling volitional laughs communicative, which implies that spontaneous laughs are not communicative. And um, so I, I don't know. I, 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 I just struggle. Is, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm using communicative because I think that, but not always, but frequently is the intention. And 
really intense laughter when you get to that real like you say the sort of step function when they're just lost in it that that there's almost sort of lost people don't make eye contact and there's no that, that, that it's too sort of lost in the emotion to so be uh, useful as a, as a something that's actually communicative i mean obviously you're signaling something but there's no back and forth on it yeah all right I, I'll, I'll uh i could ask more but i'll let other people go <laughs> Great. Okay. Thanks. So just a reminder for people, we, we do have to wrap up early. We have 10 more minutes until 1.15. Let's take three more questions, Sean, Molly, and then Kasia. Perfect. Thank you so much again for this really interesting presentation. Um, I was really intrigued by the fact that when people are laughing, it makes people more likely to laugh at something and how that relates to the canned laughter on traditional sitcoms. Um, uh, what I was wondering, though, is if there's any difference between whether or not the laugh you hear from other people is voluntary rather than spontaneous. So when it's a traditional sitcom, they'll often be given a prompt to laugh at, at this point. It could maybe even sound slightly different so that you, the reason why so many people are pushed back from the laugh track on sitcoms is because of how artificial it sounds versus if you mm -hmm. see a talk show and you have a live audience that's responding in a moment, and then you see even the people, the guests responding on the chairs. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts were on that. It is, I've done a bit of digging into this, and I, it's very interesting that the, it comes from radio. So when people were first broadcasting comedy on the radio, so, you know, back at the start of the last century, um, they had a problem with comedy in that people at home didn't necessarily realize they were hearing something that was meant to be funny because it had, it wasn't how they normally encountered funny stuff. That would have been a live thing. And the comedians didn't like it because they were presenting to nothing. So they started recording them in front of a live theater audience. And there's a really interesting niche area of BBC complaints about comedians doing things to make the audience laugh in the room that the audience at home didn't understand what was happening. It was so, so then we move over to television and television and sitcoms just took the structure of radio sitcoms in uh, studio audiences and all and it became how you did comedy on the television and it's expensive having a live audience so then you get recorded laughter tracks coming in and that's when recorded well that's when laughter tracks really starts like a nosedive and you get a split between comedy that does and doesn't have it um and now you end up with this much you know some comedy quite pointedly doesn't need to have laughter and it shows you in fact some comedies edited such that there couldn't be laughter things like arrested development there's no gaps for you to laugh in you're not expected to be laughing um and and some programs like cheers or friends made a whole point of having a live studio audience and telling you it was a live studio audience and friends would actually do dress rehearsals with a live audience there to see where the laughs happened and then change the script so you could sort of sweeten the laugh naturally so it's kind of split into this much wider thing but if you pick up an inauthenticity in it or if it's the source of comedy that doesn't feel like it should have laughter, people really are uncomfortable with it. And you end up with a big, you know, there's a television program in the UK called Mrs. Brown's Boys, which manage your expectations, guys. It, the big thing is that it's a man dressed as a woman who is Mrs. Brown, I know. That's <laughs> really, you know, subtle stuff. And it's filmed in front of a live audience who are having a riot of a time. And when I first saw it, I was just like, what is happening? This is hell on earth. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. And, um, but, you know, it might as well have been waving a big flag saying, Sophie, this is not for you. This is not your kind of comedy. Go to some other place. You know, so it kind of fits in with your aesthetic appreciation of it as well. But it is it is interesting that back to live comedy, no stand up comedian. I think I find one example of one person ever who has released a live recording of them doing their comedy who does not use an audience, mm -hmm. you know, and and that's because they want that sound there. They are funnier when they can hear that people think they're funny. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, got, it's, it's probably not gonna move away from that kind of thing. Super interesting, uh, thank you. Um, Molly, do you, do you have a question? Oh yeah, I was just wondering, so this is a very interesting conversation um, about social laughter that serves other functions like nervousness or uh, derision or, or exclusion, you know, not always this, social contagion of joy, you know, in its intention or its effect. And yeah. so, you know, when you have um, people with social deficits, like you were talking about psychopathy or autism, like, do they have difficulty understanding these other functions of laughter in the same way? Or does it have 
different developmental timing? Do I, uh, does it have different brain uh, network signatures, that kind of thing? I mean, it's, it's very interesting, the example of autism, because people with autism frequently report that neurotypical people's laughter is strange and they laugh at odd things. But people with autism laugh. And I think often it's possibly because we kind of, you know, they're dropped in with a load of neurotypical people. If they were with a load of other people with autism, they would probably find the laughter more easy, maybe, you know. But it's, um, I think we haven't, <laughs> we haven't always been asking the questions the right way. So actually the, the reason why we came up with this, adding the joke onto the end of the laugh thing to find out about the effects of laughter is because we were asking, we were doing studies with autistic people and asking them questions about what the laughter sounded like because that's what we always did. And I don't think they knew what we meant because the results were always very inconsistent. And then you frame it differently, just like how funny is that joke? And then people know that's, that has a much more, you know, ecological validity has been mentioned. That is more ecologically valid. And they start to perform exactly the same as the neurotypical people. In fact, if anything, they found everything funnier. So I think sometimes because we're you know, maybe neurotypical people asking the question, we're not asking the questions right. And I think it is possible there could be brain differences. We are trying to take some of this into the scanner. And certainly my colleague Sarah White has argued that, for example, with theory of mind, people with autism who do struggle with theory of mind, they do work it out in the end. They use different brain systems to support it than the neurotypical group, but they do know what it means. So I think that would be quite interesting. That, so the next step for us, when we get back into the scanner, is to run that, um, adding the laughter onto a joke study in the scanner and do so with neurotypical and autistic adults and see if we get the same brain regions recruited or if it actually does look different. So it is possible it could go that way. You could have the same behavior, but it's resting on a different network. Great. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, okay, let's take one more question from Kasia. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be back. And Sophie, thank you for an excellent talk as always. A good laugh. And like Greg, it gives me a million questions and ideas, but I will ask uh, the one question I'm really interested in your opinion on. And it's, it's going back to what Greg was saying and actually what many people commented on in one way or another is about the role of um, communication and this difference between spontaneous and volitional laughter. And something I think uh, you and Greg and most people here would agree on is it's not bipolar, like you say. There isn't just spontaneous and volitional, it's on a continuum. And yet yeah. in our research, we tend to have to divide these because it's experimental psychology, as you say. But I'm curious of your opinion about how we can really better get at that question in terms of really understanding the role of volition in human vocalizations, we will need to really study this more on a continuum. And how can we do that? And maybe, I don't know, uh, neural investigations are really a better way to, to get at this. So I'm curious what you think. Well, um, like I said before, I think exactly that, the, the brain systems are going to be the way to address the question. And I think that's because we can very clearly distinguish a, a, what we could be described as a purely volitional and a purely um, a, spontaneous networks they are different they are anatomically different now i suspect that actually in function like i was saying to greg i suspect that it's not we're actually seeing laughter in real conversations in real interactions it will be more of this spectrum and i suspect the spectrum probably reflects a very interesting interplay of the two systems i think probably the thing we'll get yeah. from that is that there's a very interesting dynamism there and to do this, we're going to need better scanning techniques than we have at the moment, because at the moment it's very, very hard to scan people when they're laughing full stop because they move so much. So we're trying to use different sequences to actually get into. But we we got we had some data and then went into lockdown. So you know, at some point it will restart. But I think that will be the thing. It won't just be that there'll be differential activation of the two networks. I think actually they'll be interacting, and I think the dynamics of that interaction will be ways of starting to see more the complexity that's probably underlying that, that clear spectrum. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you. you. Okay, um, I have one more hand up. I know you've got to go very quickly, Deborah. if you have a very quick question for Sophie. Deborah. Sorry, so as far as the, as the intercostal muscles in upright humans, do you think that birds use the same thing in bird song? Um, 
but it's different in birds because humans bear, have air going in and air going out and right. it's more unidirectional flow for right. birds and the syrinx and the control of the syrinx makes the larynx look like a, like a poor sad okay. thing to um, okay so um i think there are some very interesting commonalities between the management of sound production and the learning of sound production and the and the sort of complexity of sound production across uh, you know mammals that can learn new songs and humans and which includes humans and songbirds but i think some of the mechanics of the actual production are likely different that being said there was a paper a couple of years ago showing an a, in a very social parrot in new zealand it was showing a clear play vocalization um when it was playing and when it was some physical interactions with other parrots so you know it, there may the production may be different but there may still be play vocalizations in these very social birds that have some strong similarities to laughter right um i just wanted to say one thing thank you so much sophie for this talk i think of laughter myself as taking the pointy edges off of our communication sometimes that's just by because just like the orangutan not seeing the cup with a ball in it and then not seeing uh, seeing the cup without it it's a shock it's a script jump and it it sort of shakes you and so laughter is a way of expressing and kind of overcoming that script jump but also sometimes it takes the edge out of um, passive aggression because a lot of people deliver their passive aggression with laughter and it also is meant to sort of take back the pointed, you know, the sharpness of that stab. <laughs> <laughs> I so, thank you. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Sophie. It's a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. That's a um, good point to end on. Um, I know it's late there, Sophie. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming and talking to us. It was really great talk, lots of thought provoking stuff. Um, I hope you come back again soon. Um, everyone, please, uh, please, if you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, let's, let's thank Sophie for a great talk. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Great questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you, Sophie. Thanks everyone. Um, see you all after spring break. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.